Welcome to Chemistry 111. Today we're going to continue on with uh, Chapter 9, Stoichiometry. Continue on with the math. Now, then we still got quite a bit before we do the next test. We still got to finish this chapter. Still got to finish, uh, what, like, gas chapter and thermodynamics, which is all math, math, and more math. Tell you right now, be working on the homework, trying to base the tests kind of on the homework. If you don't know exactly what the question's asking on the homework, send me an email. I'm very good about trying to answer those and trying to point you in the right direction. I've seen on the test is a lot of people don't know what the heck they're doing, don't know what this means or that means. So. There's time to reach out and get help. If you are completely lost and you sat through my class and were listening to me or half paying attention and you're still completely lost, reach out. For goodness sake. We can talk about it in lab. We can talk about it in class. We can talk about it in various places. Get you pointed on the right track before test four comes around and kicks you in your ass. So... Let's just keep that in mind. Reaching out to get help. It's the first step to getting help. If you're just quiet, I don't hear from you, and then test rolls around and suddenly you don't know anything. There's not much I, we can do at that point. So we gotta be a little bit more proactive. But with that in mind, we'll go ahead and get started in just a second. So, we previously in this chapter, if, you, if you're not quite clear what's going on, we talked about how we turn mass of one reactant or one product into mass of another substance. The mathematics we do there. We talked about it essentially break it down grams to moles to moles to grams. We're converting grams of a reactant to grams of a product, but we always have to go through an intermediate of a mole because we can compare moles to moles by using the balanced chemical equation. We introduced the basics of that, and then we introduced it in the concept of limiting reagents. If we have a mass of two different reagents, and I want to say how much products could be formed, I would have to find out first which one limits the total amount of reaction gone. There's a, when we look at the homework a little bit later, either today or, or on Monday, there's a very good question like uh, about this. The saying like, oh, if I try to make a cheese sandwich and I have like, and I have to use three pieces of cheese per sandwich and I have to use two pieces of bread and I have, say, 22 pieces of bread and uh, 32 pieces of cheese, how many sandwiches can I make? Well, 22 bread pieces would make 11 sandwiches. 32 pieces of cheese can make a little bit under 10 sandwiches. So even though I have more bread, it would be, I can make 10 and two thirds of a sandwich. I'm one piece of cheese shy of 11th sandwich. So even though I have enough bread to make 11, I only have enough cheese to make 10 full sandwiches. That's the kind of idea we're dealing with when we talk about limiting reagents. If one of them runs out first, reaction stops. Okay. So percent yield. Percent yield is another concept. Typically, it's more strongly used in lab than anywhere else. But percent yield looks at the efficiency of a reaction. In a perfect world, everything would be 100% efficient, but that's not where we're at. 
our engines don't have 100% efficiency. A lot of the fuel we burn doesn't get converted into work, it gets converted into heat that is lost. We, uh, all, a lot of our reactions don't just give us what we want. There's some sometimes degradation products, sometimes there's side reactions, sometimes it just doesn't all react. So we can, we have to look at what's called the percent yield. Percent yield is simply a measure of the actual product formed divided by the hypothetical amount of product that could be formed. So we're going to measure what's called the theoretical yield, which is the maximum possible yield, assuming a hundred percent conversion. Whenever we do the grams to moles to moles to grams conversion, that is in itself a theoretical yield. Because if I say I had like, the, go back to the sandwich analogy. If I said I had 32 pieces of cheese, that tells me I can completely make 10 sandwiches. In a perfect world, I should be able to make 10 sandwiches. What happens if I drop some cheese on the floor though? Well, obviously well, that cheese is, we're probably not gonna wanna put that on a sandwich. So we've lost some of our perspective materials so we cannot produce the maximum amount. Maybe we only produce nine sandwiches. Maybe a, a, the dog jumps on the table, and eats one. You only have eight sandwiches. So we'd be looking at what do we actually have, which we can physically observe at the end versus how many we should have been able to make in a perfect world. So all it's going to mean in the long run is that we're going to do the grams to moles to moles to grams, and then we're going to add this extra step at the end. We're going to take the actual yield divided by our theoretical yield. Now, to practice this, we're going to go back to the same equation. It's not exactly an amazing equation, but it's an equation that uh, of some interest. So six carbon, three oxygen, goes to four iron ore, I mean, four iron and six CO2. Now, last time we said, oh, we had, we found out we had excess carbon and we had limited amount of iron ore. So in this case, we're just saying, everything else is in excess. If I have this much, iron ore and I produce this much iron, what is the efficiency? What is the yield? What is the yield we would get? So go into the dot cam. We have it here. Once again, we need our molar masses. Iron for all intents and purposes, we're gonna say 56. Oxygen is 16. That makes this guy, if I remember right, that's 160. I'm gonna double check, but yeah, 160. I happen to remember that from the many, many times I've used this equation and this chemical formula. So setting this up grams to moles to moles to grams, I set up 480 grams of iron oxide at on top. Use my molar mass, 160 grams iron oxide per one mole iron oxide. I set that up so grams and grams cancel out. Now I use my balanced chemical I know I have to put the two on bottom because we need moles of iron oxide to cancel with moles of iron oxide. Thus, that means I'd have to have the four on top. And because of this, I know I need the 56 on top so that we cancel out that. Now, 
technically, you can write a generalized equation. Mass A divided by molar mass of A times, times molar mass of B and then, then times the ratio. Moles A moles B. You could write that and, and skip all these steps. However, however, it can get sometimes confusing. And that's why I'm just going to show all the work to try to just where I'm getting these numbers. Rather than memorizing an equation, just showing how I systematically convert one thing to another. So 480 divided by 160 times 4 divided by 2 times 56. That would give us the hypothetical, the theoretical yield should be 336 grams of iron. That's a theoretical. That's the maximum amount of iron that could be produced from 480 grams of iron oxide. Now to calculate the percent yield, percent yield is just actual, which is 300 grams given in the problem, divided by theoretical, which we just calculated. And because it's a percent, we have to multiply by 100. So 300 divided by 336 times 100 is 89. Point, we'll say 3%. 89%. So not too bad. But that is the other major component. Grams to moles to moles to grams. There is going to be one other thing we're going to learn here with concentration. But that's not quite yet. But. So keep in mind, it's always posted. So you miss the work too fuzzy, you can always access these online from the Google Classroom. So all the things we were talking about here when we're talking the grams to moles to moles to grams, we're all dealing with solids. Solids. Now, we could do the same with solutions. And we will spend a good deal about talking about concentrations of solutions because a lot of the chemistry we're going to be dealing with will be dissolved in water. So a quick reminder, when we're talking about a solution, a solution is a solvent, the thing that does the dissolving, uh, that then dissolves some substance. It could be a solid, could be another liquid, could be a gas. But the thing that gets dissolved is the solute. So a solute dissolved into a solvent becomes a solution. Now, a solution, by definition, is homogeneous, homogeneous in nature, meaning that it's uniformly mixed. If you have it solidify on the bottom, precipitate on the bottom, it's not really a solution anymore. It could be a suspension, it could be a colloid, but not really a solution. Now, we can look at various different scenarios depending on how much solute versus how much solvent. You can look in here, kind of a red Kool-Aid mixed with the uh, water. Depending on how much water per Versus how much Kool-Aid you can see it's like very faintly red, slowly shifting to more red as we get more molecules, more dye red, and to the, the deepest red over here, where we have lots of molecules in solution. Now, this ratio of solute to solvent will be referred to as the concentration. When we uh, talk about one where the, where the solute is high compared to the solvent, 
it's would say a concentrated solution and when it's low say it's a dilute solution and oftentimes we'll talk about we need to dilute this solution so we're going to go from a concentrated scenario to less concentrated but how do we measure this we'll measure this with a new unit you may have seen this you may have seen this especially if you did the light lab uh, last week lab number three you saw on the bottles various no numbers with an m after it that m stands for molarity 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 is a way of dealing with instead of density deals with grams per volume well molarity deals with instead moles in a given volume it's like molar density so molarity is physically defined as the moles of solute over the volume of solution often given in liters so it's a moles per liter now please note moles per liter and capital m are interchangeable there is something that you can either if you say capital m you mean moles per liter if you say moles per liter it can be abbreviated as capital m there's many other units that that do this conversion like there's like joule which we'll get to next chapter which is an energy is a way of looking at well like a force applied over a distance and like newtons are is like I'm trying to remember like mass times acceleration or something like that newtons is a way to deal with a force that there's like if you take several units together you can convert them into something a little bit simpler okay uh but but one thing to note that you can if this is moles per liter you can also treat this as millimoles per milliliter or kilomoles per kiloliter but the ratio is will simplify back down to the moles per liter but with that being said, one you can treat this as a density, and that is, what's it? I'd like to say intrinsic property, meaning if you have more volume, you're going to have more atoms. If I have a one molar solution and I take one liter out, I should have about one mole of, of the solute. If I double the volume and take two liters out, I'm going to double the amount of solute I extract out. If I take only 500 milliliters out, I'd get only a half a mole out because it's the one-to-one -one ratio. To calculate molarity, you can just simply take a moles that are dissolved and divide by the volume. So I'm not even going to switch to the dot cam. I can just verbally walk you through here. What is the molarity of three moles of NaOH in 12 liters? So our moles are three. Our volume is 12. Three divided by 12 is one fourth or 0.25 molar. 0.25 M. What happens if I had 0.35 moles dissolved into 500 milliliters? You would have to turn 500 milliliters into liters, which would be 0 0.5, but it'd be 0.35 divided by 0.5, which would give you a molarity of 0.7. So 0.7 molar. And it's just simply outset our moles divided by our liters. And we're going to have to get used to converting moles to liters or liters to moles. There's a thousand milliliters in one liter. Now, we'll often want to do dilutions. I will be doing dilutions all the time. Uh, concentrated solutions are easy to work with. And once they're diluted, it's kind of hard to go back. 
but it allows you to spread it out and actually save some of the danger. What, what would be really dangerous at a high concentration can be rather benign at a low concentration. Uh, vinegar by itself, it's a, it's a food additive. We can put that on our food. If, well, some people will. I mean, you have fish and chips, you have salt and vinegar chips. You put some vinegar on there. You can add a, a spike, kind of a, that sour tangy flavor. But if you have it concentrated enough, it can actually be very caustic and burning. That would be rather dangerous. So often we'll want to change the concentration by undergoing a dilution. So we're going to take a concentrated stock solution, take a small portion of it out, and dilute it to more useful volume. Now, one thing to note that when we add more solvent and dilute to a new molarity, the moles or atoms that we have transferred have not changed. If I take one molar solution and I add a bunch of water, the same amount of moles does not go up, does not go down just the amount of water that surrounds it. Just the amount of water. So we're looking at only the ratio will change, not the moles. And this is why we're going to be able to do this equation that we're going to see on the next slide. The equation, this has many different forms, but this will keep coming back. I have to kind of yell at a lot of my students in the 112 class because this came back in 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 on the on the test they took last night and a lot of people totally blanked on how to use this properly i told them this is supposed to be the easy part you shouldn't forget this don't be confused by this this is way easier than the rest of the stuff you're doing but some still blank out the 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 overall equation is just called m1 v1 equals m2 v2 Basically looking at it, it's a comparison of a molarity and volume at one situation and a molarity volume at the other situation. You can look at it as M over the concentrated solution and the volume at the concentrated equals M of the dilute solution and volume of the dilute solution. Because the idea here, M times V, let's break that down, M times V. M, remember, is a moles per liter. If you multiply by a volume, moles per liter gives us moles. Now, the moles that we start with and the moles that we end with have not changed. We are just adding more volume. We're not adding more of the thing being dissolved. We're just adding more water to do the dissolving. So that's why we're able to set moles of concentrated to equal to moles of dilute. And then all said and done, you divide by our new volume and you can get it back into moles per liter or molarity again. So hypothetically, say I have one molar NaOH. If I take 25 mils of that out and dilute it to 100, the new concentration goes down. So one times 0 0.025 liters equals M2 times 0 0.100 liters. If I do that, the molarity has gone from one to 0.25. And I've gone from a volume of 25 mils to a volume of 100 mils, something I could spread around a lot further. Just like you ever do any cleaning in your house? You want to use like, make homemade bleach spray or homemade vinegar spray. What are you going to do? You're going to use some concentrated vinegar, put it in a spray bottle, mix it with a little bit of water, mix it with some water. So you can spray it around the house, try to disinfect things or spray the bleach around the house, try to disinfect things. Not too concentrated that, that it's going to like stain your clothes or anything like that, but enough that it'll kill the bacteria. Like, oh, I cut some meat here. I'm going to spray it with the bleach spray. If 
try to disinfect. You're spreading it out by diluting it. So what volume would we need to dilute in order to turn 50 mils of a five molar into one molar? So I'm gonna to go to doc cam just so we can set this up. The hardest part here is, is you gotta make sure you know what goes to what. What goes to what? You have M1V1 equals M2V2. I want to know the volume that would turn 50 mils of a 5 molar solution. 50 mils of a 5 molar solution. So that 50 mils belongs with that 5 molar. So we're wondering what is the volume that would turn 50 mils of a 5 molar into one molar. So we're wondering what volume goes with that one molar to give it this dilution. So I've associated my these two variables together and these two variables together. The point is just plugging it in. 5m times 0 0.050 liters equals 1m times volume. Setting that up, I say five times 0 0.05 divided by one, divided by one, and how? what would we get? We'd get 0 0.25 liters, which is equal to 250 milliliters. So I would take those 50 milliliters and dissolve it to 250, and that would change the concentration by that effect. I dilute it by a factor of five to get rid of one-fifth of the concentration. Now, it is also going to be possible for us to calculate molarity from mass and mass from molarity. Because remember, we're always going through moles. We're going to go moles, we're going to grams to moles, and then from moles you could go to molarity. Or we can go from molarity to moles and then go into grams. So in order to make a solution, you'll often be given the mass and we can figure out what I need to dissolve it in to make the proper solution. We need to calculate the moles. Blah, blah, blah. So what is the molarity of solution of 34 grams of iron oxide or grams of FeO in 1.4 liters of water and then there's another question, 3.2 molar of H2O2. What is the grams in 67 mils? Okay, so we're gonna go both ways here. Okay, so start with, that. remember we're gonna say iron was 56, oxygen is 16 from the periodic table. 56, 16, it would be 72 grams per mole. Like, so breaking it down, breaking it down. 34 grams of FeO. First, we turn this into moles. 72 grams of FeO per one mole of FeO. Then, to get lead to get molarity, we'd have to divide the moles by the liters. So we'd have 34 divided by 72 divided by 1.4. 
what we would get is 0.3, we'll say 3,4 moles iron oxide per liter, which is the same as molarity of FeO. Going backwards, if I had 3.2 molar hydrogen peroxide, that's the same as saying 3.2 moles of hydrogen peroxide per one liter. If I wanna know what is the mass, well, what mass would I deliver in 67 milliliters? So I need to get rid of the liters, so I'm going to use, multiply by our volume, 0 0.067 liters, cancels the liters, and then I'm going to use the molar mass. Hydrogen peroxide, 16 times 2 plus 1 times 2. So the molar mass right here is 34 grams of peroxide per moles of hydrogen peroxide. Moles and moles cancel. The only units we're left with is grams. We have 3.2 times 0 0.067 times 34. All said and done, 67 mils of a 3.2 molar solution would deliver 7.2, we'll say 7.3 7 grams of the active ingredient. 7.3 grams of the oxidizer hydrogen peroxide. Now, So all this is worked out here. Right. Now, we're going to use this in, in lab eventually on something called titration. Titration, where we're, we're going to use the M1V1 equals M2V2 equation to determine the concentration of an unknown based on the concentration we know of a known. We're going to take a standard solution that we know the concentration of relatively well and slowly add this into the unknown compound. This is called the titration. We're gonna titrate this in with a very uh, special piece of equipment called a burette. It's a really long slender tube. It's kind of like a graduated cylinder, but with a little spigot on the bottom so that we can carefully add small amounts of sample at a time. We're gonna add this until we get to a special point known as the equivalence point, the point when the moles of one substance cancels with the moles of the other substance. Once we achieve that point, we will know, we will simply know the mole ratio. With knowing the mole ratio, we could then figure out what is the concentration of the known. So typically we're gonna do it with acids and bases and that's what we're gonna do it in lab, but we can do it with anything that reacts on a, a simple basis and that has an easy way to determine the equivalence point. So we're gonna use it with a, a colorimetric indicator called a called phenolphthalein that in acid solution, it is colorless. In base solution, it's gonna turn pink. In too much base, it's gonna be downright magenta. But the idea is that we're gonna to get to a point when it goes from clear to all the way pink, and then we're gonna know if I added this much volume to get it there, how much, what, what is the moles of acid 
base, the bones of base. So we're going to set this up, our special M1, V1 equals M2, V2 equation being that molarity times volume of acid equals molarity times volume of base. So, but this is the equation they should have remembered in class, and they did not. They did not remember how to do this. It's set, you'll have three out of the four values, and you simply find the last one. Now, we're going to solve these problems and start looking at the homework. We don't have too much time left, so... We'll look more at the homework again on Monday, but we'll start here. 15 mils of HF is titrated by 0.125 molar NaOH. After 43 mils of the base, we get the equivalence point. And I ask, what is the concentration of the acid? Hopefully you remember NaOH is a base, HF is an acid. HF is the hydrogen donor, OH is the hydrogen acceptor, that H and OH goes to water. The other question, 20 mils of ammonia is neutralized by the addition of 8.2 mils of, of 0.95 molar acetic acid. HC2, H3O2. This one, I don't expect you to know which one is the base, but I'll be able to link the two things together. Okay, let's do this. So this first thing, first one, our molarity of acid is unknown. We're solving for that. But the volume of acid is our 15 mils. Our molarity of base is given as 0 0.125 molar. The volume of base, we say the equivalence point is achieved after 43 mils. So our M a V A equals M B V B becomes M A times we'll say point zero one five equals zero point one two five times zero point zero four three. Now please note you could leave both of these volumes in milliliters. As long as they're both in milliliters, you will get the same answer because the volumes cancel out. The volumes will cancel out because both of these are essentially divided by a thousand. If you divide both of them by a thousand, you're going to be the same as multiplying a net effect of one. But 0.125 times 0.043 divided by 0.015 is the molarity of acid would be 0.358. So I, so I could 0.125 times 43 divided by 15. Now let me try this again. 0.125 times 43 divided by 15. 0.358. So it doesn't matter whether you leave them in milliliters or liters as long as they're in the same units. That's the key thing, same units. The next problem. We don't know which one's acid, which one's base, but we know we have 20 mils of an unknown. 20 mils of, so that's a V1. We don't know what is the M1. But well, we do know that M2 is 0.95 and the V2 is 8.2 because they say 8.2 mils of 0.95. So the 8.2 is referring to those, keeping those together. M1 
times 20 equals 0.95 times 8.2. So divide both sides by 20 and you've got M1. M1 equals 0.95 times 8.2 divided by 20. So we get the M1 in this case is 0 0.390 or 0 0.39 altogether. That should be the last slide on this chapter. This chapter was all about turning grams to moles to moles to grams, applying that to limiting reagents, applying that to percent yield, and introducing molarity and the M1V1 equation. Now, this is kind of a short chapter, but it's really hitting hard on the math. Take your time, take your time, take your time. Looking at the homework ever so briefly, it's, we're not going to have a whole lot of time. But there is only, uh, did I fall asleep? What's going on? Okay, there we go. Well, there's only nine problems. However, there is, it's, they're, they're gonna build on each other. So I'm not sure if some people skip around, but if I remember right, the first one, the first one deals with, um, the first one deals with going from moles to moles. It says, how many moles of potassium phosphate are produced by this many moles? Then there's maybe grams to moles to moles. And then it finally goes grams to moles to moles to grams before moving on to some more complicated thing like like percent yield. So here's the the cheese sandwich problem. Cheese sandwich problem, there's, then we have a situation of limiting reagents. I think uh, one or two percent yield problems. And then, okay, so there's no, in this particular setup, this one, there's no molarity. I'm not sure if there's molarity on another set of problems. I'll have to look at that a little bit. But only nine problems. Some of this is practice. So looking at this, how many moles of potassium phosphate are produced by two moles of potassium hydroxide? So, so KOH are potassium hydroxide. If I have two moles, the, the relationship of potassium phosphate to potassium hydroxide is a three to one ratio. So for every three moles of potassium phosphate, we would produce one mole of potassium hydro, we would need one, three, for every one mole of potassium phosphate we produce, we needed three moles of potassium hydroxide. Since we only have two, the ratio is gonna be two divided by three times one. So you would get an answer that is two-thirds, or 0.667. Skip to one where we actually need some heavy-duty math. So this one, if I have 2.27 moles of potassium iodide, 2.27 moles Ki, what mass of lead iodide could I form? And you notice the equation, there's a two to one ratio. Two to one ratio. This one's gonna be a pretty heavy mass as we go to the dot cam. 
in the equation, there was two moles of Ki for every one mole of PBI2. Now here's the hard part. What is the molar mass of PBI2? Lead, if I'm not mistaken, is something like 207. But just to make sure, 207. And iodine is something crazy as well, like 126. We'll, we'll, we'll say 127. So lead iodide has a crazy molar mass of 461. And one mole of lead iodide done like 461 grams. So set this up, moles of Ki, moles of Ki, moles of lead iodide, moles of lead iodide gives us our molar mass. And gives us our mass. 2.27 divided by 2 times 461 you'd get a mass that's something like 523 grams. 523. Now, as I said, yeah, let's go ahead and plug that in. 523. That's all the time we have for today. We will look at more of these problems on Monday. Look at more of these problems on Monday. Just to help walk you through, make sure you've seen these before and you can do them on your own if your numbers change a little bit. In the meantime, this has been Andrew Evans, and I will talk to you again shortly.